your pathway to being a president is you've, you've got to do the hard work. There are no shortcuts. Welcome to Spur of the Moment, the podcast of Colorado State University's Spur Campus in Denver, Colorado. She said, I cannot believe you're paying me to do what I love to do. And I said, that's called a career. And that's different than a job. There are institutions that are Hispanic enrolling institutions, and there's Hispanic serving. And I'm very proud to say we are an Hispanic serving institution. Hello, and welcome to Spur of the Moment, the podcast of Colorado State University's Spur Campus in Denver, Colorado. On this podcast, we talk with experts in food, water, and health about how they are tackling the big challenges in these areas. And in some episodes, like today's, we focus on members of the CSU community across the state of Colorado and their contributions to solving big global challenges. I'm Jocelyn Hiddle, and I am joined today by Tim Mote, the president of Colorado State University Pueblo. Welcome, President Mote. Thank you, Jocelyn. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for being with us. I will keep my introduction very brief today since we'll talk more about your trajectory later, but I will mention that President Mote became the president of CSU Pueblo in 2017, coming to CSU Pueblo from Northwest Missouri State, where he was provost. Prior to that, President Mote served as dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication at Texas State and chaired the Department of Communications at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Between 1998 and 2007, President Motte was a professor of communications at Texas State. It is wonderful to have President Motte as now part of the CSU system for the last four years. The CSU system includes CSU Fort Collins and CSU Global, as well as uh, his campus in Pueblo. And we also have a campus in Todos Santos, Mexico, and of course, the new Spur campus that's coming online in January in Denver. So, President Mote, I wonder if we can start with some thoughts from you about CSU Pueblo. What brought you to the university, and and what should we know about it? What brought me to the university was actually my spouse. He found an advertisement in the Chronicle of Higher Ed uh, for a presidential opening at CSU Pueblo, and he grew up in a, a migrant farm family, and they traveled the United States as migrant farm workers. And a part of their journey was to Rocky Ford, Colorado. And he and his family have always told me that throughout their travels in the United States, the one place that treated them with the greatest amount of respect was in Pueblo, Colorado, because they journeyed through Pueblo. And so he said, it's an Hispanic serving institution, and that's the type of institution that I wanted to be a part of. And he said, I think you need to take a look at this. So it was through his browsing through the Chronicle of Higher Ed, which is always on our coffee table. And I, I really had no idea that he reviewed that publication, but he, he did and brought it to my attention. So that, that really started it. I'm curious, once you did start digging in and learned a little bit more about CSU Pueblo, what tipped you into throwing your hat into the ring? That, that's, that's a great question. And it, 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 it happened very quickly. So um, I'm attracted to regional comprehensive universities. I like, I like universities that are embedded in communities. But I also learned early on that CSU Pueblo has a curriculum that's a very practical curriculum. I think today a lot of universities are working hard to be practical. And I was joining a university that was also had a very practical curriculum. We prepare uh, young people for uh, work in industries and in jobs and all of the degree programs that were a part of CSU Pueblo um, are degree programs that I was trained to get at other universities. So I was walking into a university that had the degree programs that resonated with me and and degree programs, I think, that are needed to drive economic development. That's obviously something that the CSU system uh, is also interested in. You know, you have CSU Fort Collins as the land grant with that focus on outreach and and taking the best in class information and putting it into people's hands. That's part of it. I think the Spur campus also has that as part of our ethic. It certainly is consistent across CSU and well, obviously CSU Global also has has incredible reach in, in terms of really making it easier for people to engage and to do really practical work. The other piece of this, which is the larger kind of philosophical piece, is the experiential learning. Um, That comes naturally at CSU Pueblo. The faculty take great pride in involving students in a very, um, uh, what John Dewey uh, talked about in the democracy of education was a very pragmatic approach to education, keeping them involved 
and something that I, I quote often, it's, it's uh, what's important to students and their learning. It's not the doing, but it's the reflecting on the doing. And as I learned more about CSU Pueblo, that's just a part of the ethos of that campus. And that, that also attracted me to the campus was this built-in ethos around experiential learning and the reflecting component on the doing. Wonderful. And so you've been there now for four years. Four years, yes. And uh, what else have you learned about it? Maybe something that, that you wish more people knew about CSU Pueblo. Yeah, I think the, the one thing that I wish more people knew would be about the quality of our faculty. Um, our faculty, um, some are nationally recognized. Many are regionally recognized for the research that they do and for the quality of their teaching. So I consider them to be teaching scholars uh, or what I call research infused teachers and scholars. And so they, they get students involved in their research early on. Um, it's how they advance their research agenda. Uh, but students self-select into majors and they identify with faculty who are doing high quality and nationally recognized work across all fields. And um, I'm very proud of them. As you should be. You bet. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the university itself. How many, roughly how many students? Um, and uh, this might be a good time also to mention that it's a Hispanic serving institution, as you, as you mentioned, and maybe say a little bit more about what that means. Yes, we we're very, uh, we are a proud Hispanic serving institution. And we, I like to lead with that because that is a big part of who we are and the work that we do. There are institutions that are Hispanic enrolling institutions and there's Hispanic serving. And I'm very proud to say we are an Hispanic serving institution. Um, we have approximately 4,000 students um, at the university. 35% um, of them are Hispanic. 50% um, of our overall students are from underrepresented groups. A, a lot of our students come from more of a working class background. Um, blue collar background. They are first generation students. Many are low income. Um, they are hungry to learn and hungry for opportunities. And so two of the things that I'm proud of is one is they have access. To, we have access to resources and our students have access to opportunities. And so the access to resources as an Hispanic serving institution, we are eligible to apply for federal funding. And we do that regularly. And we get those funds. Those funds then allow us to build capacity for our students and wrap around services and to provide unique opportunities for our students. Uh, a, a couple of these examples would be, um, we have a number of students who work every summer at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and they engage in internships. They live there and they're working there and they are exposed to another world, a very international community. The other piece is that we have partnered with Harvard University's School of Business, and we now have a number of our students taking courses throughout the summer where they get a certificate of readiness in, uh, from the School of Business at Harvard University. So these are added value opportunities, and our students are looking for opportunities, and we've got uh, we make those opportunities available for them. This is the serving part is making these opportunities available to them. And um, one day I had a, a, a young man from Pueblo who told me that he, his mom and dad wanted him to get out of Pueblo to go to college. And, um, and I told him, you know, if you come to our university, I will find an opportunity to get you out of Pueblo. Um, we've got a lot of opportunities to position you in other countries and other cities and other states to do fascinating work. Um, you will come back and you'll get a degree from our institution. But if that's what you're looking for, we can make that happen. And um, he was convinced and um, he became a student with us. So it's, um, yeah, I, I, I think we do a great job of getting people out of Pueblo. Um, and then um, I love for them to come back. And so that's, that's one of our goals as well. Right. Of course, it's a it's broadening the horizons and then how you can apply that back at home. Yeah, I find that once they leave, um, there's a yearning to return and, um, and it doesn't take them long. But sometimes um, sometimes they the, the myth is the grass is greener on the other side. And often, as we all know, um, that experience is invaluable, but it also allows you to be more discerning about where you're where you're from and your home. 
I know also that you all at CSU Pueblo have recently adopted a new vision, Vision 2028. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? What are the major pillars and how did how was that plan developed? Yeah, uh, the Vision 2028 was when I was hired, um, the chancellor and the governors made it very clear that they wanted a bold vision for our university that they could get behind and support. And um, that's another reason why I was attracted to this job was just that that's an incredible opportunity for any uh, president. And so I went to the campus and we, we established a structure for how to do this. And um, something that I, I don't think a lot of people know about is I, uh, we formed a cross-functional group of our employees and um, there was a lead and our lead, um, I trusted our lead to lead this group and the leadership team received the vision. It was a vision that our employees developed outside of our influence. We gave them guardrails and we received it. And I remember the day we had a cabinet meeting where they came in and presented it to us and we received our vision about where they thought we needed to go. And it was a very powerful process of them turning it over to us and then us reading it and processing it. And that's the vision that we adopted. And the vision is for CSU Pueblo to become the people's university for Colorado and for the Southwest United States. It's a bold vision because that was the charge, boldness. And so we, we did that. And so we want to be a university for all people. And in our community, uh, Pueblo is Latin for people. Um, it's in our name. Um, we are a regional comprehensive university. And in the 60s, regional comprehensive universities were referred to as the people's universities because these were universities that were embedded in more rural outposts in states that were responsible for developing nurses, teachers, and business leaders, individuals who could take care of the people of a community. That was the role of regional comprehensive universities. And then Pueblo in the late 1800s was referred to as the people's town. It was a town that was receptive to immigrants of all, all um, walks of life to be employed in, in the steel mills. And so we took those three touch points and people became kind of the coalescing idea. And so being, being a university for all people is, is what we're about. Um, our mission statement is very practical. We prepare students, we develop students to navigate a rapidly changing world. Every employee, I tell them, if you're not doing that, you're off track. But that is what we do every day. That's the mission that we're doing. And the pillars are, we're creating four unique student experiences that will differentiate us and allow us to be the people's university. One is called CSU Pueblo Pathways. It's a comprehensive um, advising model, a professional advising model that also includes um, a heavy career exploration piece to it. Um, the second one is called CSU Pueblo Works. A lot of universities, our students have to work in order to afford to go to college. And it was my belief that in the past, we used to view students' employment as an obstacle that we had to work around. We're now putting their work at the center of their education, and we're building an education around their work. CSU Pueblo Discovery is getting our students involved in early on in their academic career, working with faculty on discovery processes. It's creating and discovering. That's what we do at universities. We want them to leave with an intellectual product that they've created, built, designed, uncovered, but that is, that's the ultimate goal. And then CSU Pueblo Journey is to give our students a grant, a journey grant that allows them to expedite. First, it retains them at the university. And the second, it, it expedites their pathway through the university to graduate on time by giving them an opportunity to uh, complete a summer of, ex of intensive study at our campus at, at, CSU, at, at uh, Toto Santos, Mexico, um, which really connects them many of our students with their heritage, which is also important to us, or uh, they can apply their grant to um, summer school on our campus to expedite their time to degree completion. So um, the People's University is, is wrapped around these four large student experiences that we're creating and launching. It's amazing to me to hear you articulate it this, it, this way it feels like a, a business plan, maybe from the private sector, focused on customer, right? And in this case, what that really is, 
your students are your customers yep. and understanding what their experience is and working backward from how you, how you get to that experience is, I yep. think, a little bit different maybe for some strategic plans for, for universities. Yeah, this, is, um, this goes back to Hispanic serving. Uh, when you take a naturally occurring phenomenon, they all have they work before they, to go to college, and so um, why not make that work for us? Um, Pueblo is a is a uh, Pueblo is a community of hard workers of work people with a strong work ethic. They are um, gritty, scrappy, resourceful, determined people. And those are qualities that come to us by the nature of who they are, and that's who the that's who we are as a city. So, if you ask me, that's the strength. That's the best thing we've got going for us is this hard work ethic. And rather than not recognizing that, we are tapping into all of that, and we're doing that very intentionally. So, can you give me an example of what that looks like? I can. There's several examples, but one example would be. A student has to work. We want them to be working in a job that relates to what they would like to do versus just a part-time job. So we're going to place them with industry partners in Pueblo. We're going to place them in a job, and we're willing to pay half of their wage if the employer partners with us. They pay half of the wage. Through that partnership, the student gets paid, and that payment goes to their invoice to make college more affordable, and the student gets credit for the work that they're doing. And they do this in years one and two versus years three and four. Three and four, they do internships and capstone experiences. If you leave it only to capstone experiences or, or internships, it's too late for them to change their minds if that's not the right work for them. So we're wanting to give them exposure to work early on to make sure that they, and that also creates relevance if I'm if I'm in work and it makes sense to me, it it builds relevance of what a college degree can do. As you know, the the Spur Campus is focused on food, water, and health. A lot of that is STEM related. Um, can you speak a little bit to how does CSU Pueblo look to increase diversity in STEM and maybe highlight a few areas specific to food, water, and health that you're engaged in? Yeah, I think um, first of all, food, water, and health is important to me. I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, surrounded by concerns related to food, water, and health, and so anytime I can be a part of that, that's um, incredibly important to me. But the on our campus, we're, we're promoting students into the STEM disciplines or involved in just in closing the attainment gap. I think I want to start there. What CSU Pueblo does well is we complete students. We figured out how to educate a student who, um, an underrepresented student who is a first generation who needs more hands-on experience and more attention. And we have figured out the needs and the approach to the student where we're completing them at a rate that we are for just a, a non-underrepresented -under, student. And we're doing that well. And I think we've figured out the needs and how to, how to do that. So I think one of the things that is important to us is we've got to get this right because in the state of Colorado, um, one of the largest growing demographics is the Hispanic population. And that is a group that we serve well. And I feel um, our ability to complete students who are Hispanic and and uh, involve them in their communities, their ability to make significant contributions to their workplace, their communities, and their families is something that we do, and we do that well. And so I think by um, the numbers of students that we're graduating who are underrepresented, I think um, adds to the state of Colorado's ability to diversify the workforce throughout the state. I also think what's important is that we have found ways that um, nursing is a field that needs to, uh, uh, the diversification of nursing is important and teaching, the diversification of teachers is important. There are, those both require field-based experiences that require students to quit their job to do unpaid field-based learning experiences. So if you're from a lower economic status group, you self-select out of those majors because you can't afford to quit your job to do these place-bound 
uh, these, these field, these clinicals in student teaching. What we are doing is we're paying students um, with some help from the government. We're paying students for their student teaching and we're paying our nursing students for their clinicals. And, um, and that's how we are contributing, I believe, to STEM education. First of all, many of the teachers will go into STEM, they'll be STEM educators and nurses by design are STEM professionals. And so we're diversifying both of those high need workforces by paying our student teachers and by paying our, our nurses who are doing their clinicals. We have found a way to do that. I had a student, um, a nursing student came up to me the other day and said, she thanked me for paying her, her funding clinical in the hospital. And she said, that has made the entire, that's made a world of difference. And she said, I cannot believe you're paying me to do what I love to do. And I said, that's called a career. And that's different than a job. And so she light went on. I could see that she made a clear distinction between a career and a job. And um, she goes, I got it. I, that's, that's, that opened my eyes and allows me to see the difference. That's the work that we're doing. Yeah. So that story, I think, is is indicative in it of the extra steps that need to be taken in order to really crack the nut. Yeah, you know that that is that's a good point. That is the sausage making that no one ever sees higher ed do, and it. But it is it is what we do, and um, it is the policies. It is the it is the policy decisions that we make that give the students the access, the affordability, the opportunities. And these are policy decisions that we are sensitive to. A lot of policies and procedures are designed that they, they, they keep people out versus bring people in. They're roadblocks. They can be roadblocks. They can be hurdles. And so a part of what we do is constantly re, uh, remove the hurdles and we find other ways of making it work for them. But those are two examples of, of numerous ways that I think we're contributing to STEM education, STEM disciplines, which ultimately really plug into what SPUR is about through food, water, and health. Well, and I, I think we at the SPUR campus can learn from your example of really thinking about the details. Yep. It's not just about getting uh, people through our doors and maybe introducing a kid to a career they hadn't thought about before, but it's also about what are all of the steps that it actually takes to get that kid from a sixth grader. Right to, you know, being a veterinarian or a food scientist yeah. and uh, understanding all the potential barriers yeah. like the one you just described removing. Um, because ultimately what we, I would love to be able to tell the, that kind of a story that you just told about um, the gratitude from that student who now has, has this new pathway that's open to her that she wouldn't have had otherwise without right. that attention to the Right. And the this is an details. underrepresented student yes. who is going into these fields. Right. And so when you look at these careers and they're not diversified, you have to ask why. And if you, if you trace it to the money, there's a financial implication that they've got to make a decision that I can't afford to quit my job because I need the money and therefore I can't be a student teacher. So that's a career path, not for me. And so um, we have a lot of those, but it's paying attention and it's listening. Yeah, it's paying attention and listening to students to figure out the obstacles. You've talked a, a little about the city of Pueblo yes. um, already, and I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how the university and the city interact and also around the, the sustainability features of the university that I know are coming online soon. You have a big solar array coming online we do, soon. We so. do. So we are getting ready to flip a switch, which will, our, our university will be powered by the sun. And we're very excited about that. And we will be, I believe, one of the first universities in the state, if not the United States, to be powered by the sun of, of, our, of our size. Um, this is with the exception of, we have a few, we have three residence halls that are, not, I can't say it's going to be 100% because we have three residence halls who are on a different grid. But we're excited about, about this sustainability project using renewable energies. This, this taps into our value systems that came out of Vision 2028, our sustainability. This is where our students are. This is where we are. And we are uh, proud to be able to do this, to lead the way and to do this, um, yeah, to lead the way in the state. The other ways that we're connecting to the community is we've, we've just funded an Oslon Center um, at the university. 
And this is a center that connects us to the culture and the heritage of Pueblo and the history of Pueblo being a borderland community. Uh, we're divided by the Arkansas River, which divided the country at one point. And um, our community is, um, we're a very proud Chicano community. And so we're celebrating 50 years of Chicano studies this year. And that is very important to our community. And the Oslon Center is a center that can um, record our history and transmit our history and our culture to future generations. And I feel that's one of the responsibilities of a regional comprehensive university is to do that level of work. And we're, we're proud to do that. And we're excited about that. Um, I think other connections to our community will be coming in the near future. And those are going to be related to our ability to, well, we're already engaged in helping influence and drive economic development. Obviously, that's what a university does. Um, but also engage the community in ways where we can add capacity to where there might be challenges in the community. How can we map resources uh, to do that? And th that that's a part of um, where I want to go in the future. So we're going to shift gears a little bit sure. from talking about your institution to talking a little bit about you. So as you know, one of the roles we are hoping that the Spur Campus can play is to introduce young people to careers they might not have considered before. In our case, that might be watching a veterinarian perform a surgery and asking that veterinarian questions and seeing them at work or a soil scientist at work or a water scientist. But I'd love to unpack a little bit the pathway to university presidency. Okay. How does one end up a university president? Is it something that was on the horizon for you as a as a young person to be in academia? Or? No, I think so. When I graduated college, I went. I, I worked in the airline industry for ten years. So a lot of people don't know that I did ten years of airline operations work. So I developed a business acumen, um, and I developed my business teeth early on in doing that level of work. That's twenty four seven. That's a grind. I loved it. I had the best time ever. But I, um, I always tell people I had uh, a friend of mine invited me for my birthday dinner. And one night in Boston, he said, um, is your work still meaningful? And it was that question at a, a dinner celebrating my birthday. And I said, I, you know, I, it is, but I don't think it's going to be for long. And so he said, you probably need to go, go back to grad school. But back to grad school, then I knew immediately that I wanted to be a teacher and a professor. And so I had good role models. I had good mentors. So did went to graduate school in Boston. Then I ventured for my, my doctoral work at West Virginia University. Then I became an, a, an academician for 17 years. And so I, all of this was in the state of Texas. I loved it. I, I enjoyed being a professor and then was tenured and became a full professor. And throughout that journey, I had opportunities for administrative work because I was my, my prior career. And so I was, I was drawn to administrative work, and I was pretty good at it. So I became a department chair. And I've always said that if I enjoy it and if I'm good at it, I might be interested in looking at what, what comes after that. But I'm always mindful. If I'm not good at it, if it's not fulfilling, then I need to do something else. So then I had an opportunity to be a, a dean. Then I had an opportunity to be a provost. And so as I was going through this process, I started thinking about a presidency. And it was, it was at the dean level when I realized I was a dean and I thought I was pretty good at it and I enjoyed it. Then I started thinking more seriously about a presidency. It hadn't until that point, but it was at that point that I thought that that might be what I wanted to do. So, you know, the, the one thing, your pathway to being a president is you've, you've got to do the hard work. There are no shortcuts, and um, learning higher ed is a complex business. And learning every every aspect of it, but it's doing the hard work, and um, that that resulted in this wonderful opportunity that I have now. So I'm I'm very honored and proud is what I am to be here today. So there are a couple things that I heard you talk about there that I'll just circle back to for a moment. One is. You don't have to start out on the path that ultimately becomes the, the vast majority of your career, right? Airline operations to university presidency is a bit of a right turn. Yeah. Um, but how fun. Um, right. And what an insightful friend you had right. uh, who's asking you those questions right. at, at your birthday. Yep. Um, 
I, I also heard you say the hard work part that you just mentioned there. Um, and and applying that hard work in a very at a very particular intersection of what you're good at right. and what you love. Yes. And I feel like that encapsulates um, really great advice for young people as they are thinking about their career path in front of them. That not every choice is a, of a job is forever. Right. Um, and and always evaluate that whether you're at that intersection. Yeah, I found and then that, do the work. Yeah, I think that I think as a student, you've got to be you've. You're always a student and you want to be you want to be receptive to opportunities. So when someone asks you, is your work still meaningful? I think you need to listen and hear that, not brush it off, but give it some thought. And I did that. And um, I think hard work is really underestimated in many ways. Um, there is a lot of reading and studying that takes place outside of the nine to five in order for you to really become an expert at what you want to do. And, um, and so it's not just the nine to five work. It's all the other that it takes to learn and to master a field and to feel that you're ready to do that level of work. And none of that comes easy. And it's, it, it comes with some pain and it comes with failure. And the failure piece, I think, is often what gets ignored and overlooked. So when you look at it, someone's pathway to a presidency, to an outsider, it might appear seamless, but the the amount of mistakes and errors and uh, learnings along the way that have been those are also life altering, and you 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 got to listen to those and learn from those. And the, and there's no way around that. And so you've got to you got to dive into that, and not avoid that. Otherwise, you're not going to emerge. And the other thing that I've always said, Jocelyn, is I've never had a plan B. Um, and I know a lot of people think that's very naive of me, but when I go into something, I only have a plan A. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing the time or the energy to do it. And this is what I want to do. And that has always worked for me. And um, that may not work for me all the time, but it's, it's worked for me. So I put my heart, my soul into it. And if I say that's what I want to do, that's I commit myself to that and I don't have a backup plan. Well, I suspect that your plan A is not always rigid, right? So yeah, the, there's right. some flexibility in the plan A that, yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you. That was, that was great to hear a little bit about your story to where you are. So uh, maybe you can describe a little bit what a day or week in the life of being a university president is like, what is the actual job? You know the actual job. If you were to go through the day to day, it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of meetings, which is what most people do. Um, if you kind of step back and take a look at a higher level of what is the work on a day to day basis, I think it is for me. It is it's inspiring a team. It is every day. It's inspiring a team. It's supporting your team, keeping them focused, driving results. Um, helping them problem solve and um, in connecting. So at a meta level, every day when I wake up and I go to work, that's what I do. Those are the higher level functions and those are manifested in meetings. But every day I'm trying to remove an obstacle. I'm trying to support. I'm trying to inspire. I'm trying to keep people focused. On developing students so they can navigate a rapidly changing world, and that's that's a lofty mission. And there's a lot there's a lot to unpack about that. But that that's that's what we do, and that's what I keep people focused on. So that's 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 what that's what a university president does. And I think the inspiration is probably one of the most important things. Um, you've got to believe in people. You got to believe in what we're doing. You've got to believe in students because the people that you lead often don't believe in themselves. Um, and there's a point when they do believe in themselves and you just got to, you got to believe in people and um, encourage them. And before long, they internalize that and then the sky's the limit. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, the skill sets and the sort of things you are keeping in your mind as you yeah. go through your day are maybe not entirely different from someone who is the head of a corporation, but the, you're playing a long game. Yep. The outcomes are, are 
ex- extended in a way that it's not a sales cycle exactly, right? Not at all. And then there's the, um, you know, the driving the results. There is the strategy piece, which is so incredibly critical. So every day it's a strategy. You, it, that, that is probably the most important piece is to think about the strategy and working with my team to do that. And I, I surround myself with a team of um, kind of higher ed junkies who love talking strategy, like talking new ideas, who are innovative. I've surrounded myself with, with those, um, that, that group. And, um, and I enjoy them and I enjoy my time with them and I'm honored to be to working with them. So. Yeah, I think I think I've hired well. <laughs> An incredibly important <laughs> it is. skill. It yes. Is. To have I, a enjoy, great team. I enjoy my team and they are um in many ways incredibly um uh, smarter than me in so many ways and I value that tremendously. So before we go off this topic, I I do want to ask because a lot of our listeners are are potentially college students or university students and maybe out there having a job, did you have jobs? in college yourself? Yes. <laughs> I did have jobs. I was a, um, yeah, this is, people don't, I was a DJ for um, my radio station at my university. I worked at uh, a theme park called Worlds of Fun in Kansas City, and I directed traffic and parking lots for four summers. Okay, hot work. It was hot work. And so, um, and then I supervised parking lots and uh, traffic control and did all of that when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always worked. Yeah. Um, there's never been a time when I haven't been working. Um, when you grow up on a farm in Iowa and you're a son of a farm family, you're a laborer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and that's what you do. So, um, but yeah, throughout college, I worked throughout all of college and then did internships and all of that has served me well. So if you were a radio DJ, do you still have the radio DJ voice? I, I think I do. Can, can I hear it? Can we hear it? <laughs> really? Yes, please. Uh, it would be something like this. I'm. It would be, um, hello, I'm Tim Mote on KDLX Campus Radio, ready to be with you for the next full hour of rock and roll music. Thank you. Back to you, Jocelyn. That is perfect. <laughs> that takes me right back to listening to the radio. That was in- 19, that would be 1980, 81. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's, that's how radio announcers were back. Well, in the day. if you ever need a fallback, yes, which I know you don't because you never have a plan B. I don't. I want to be a president. You, <laughs> uh, maybe there's a way to weave that particular radio voice skill set into your current work because it, it be. is quite a skill. Thank I'm very impressed. You. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we just have a few minutes left. I, I do want to talk a little bit about how you see CSU Pueblo and the Spur campus engaging with one another. What, what's the opportunity? Yeah, I think the opportunity is huge. Um, one, one is you came down to our campus, you introduced Spur to our campus. I think you saw what happened. Um, there was a lot of excitement. So anytime you introduce food, water, and health to a group of academicians, there, regardless of what your program of research is, it all it all eventually leads back to food, water, and health, I would say, in some form or another. So all of our campus, our, our, our faculty saw connections and want to be a part of SPUR because SPUR is the hub. It is the uh, distribution center where you can engage and, and uh, connect with other people. You can share ideas. And so I think that's very important. I think that the second piece is for us to be a part of Introducing Colorado to Pueblo, Colorado, and to our campus is also very important. And so for the the thousands of visitors who will go to the Spur campus and to know that CSU Pueblo is a part of this, but more importantly, what is Pueblo and what does Pueblo mean in terms of food, water, and health? And so um, we are very proud of the Pueblo chili and um, yeah, and that, that is, that is huge for us. And there's other food products coming out of Pueblo, Colorado um, through food projects. And, and so there, there's an, there's an, there's an innovative, there's innovation around added value to food products that are, that are in the region, Um, whether it's cantaloupe, whether it's produce, whether it's, it's the, the pepper that is alive and well, and that I I think is a part of the food story that um, the Spur Campus can help us uh, communicate. We also have an abundance of water 
in Pueblo that we're also very proud of. And I would say an overall healthy lifestyle. So I think there are many connections, um, but, but uh, helping get the word out on CSU Pueblo, who are we, what do we do? And um, really, our, our, we want to be a preferred choice for students who are looking at regional um, public comprehensive universities. We want to be on the radar screen. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think there's a lot of students in the Denver metro area that we yeah. could inform about what the opportunities are down there. I, I remember we, we had a group from Bruce Randolph School came to our, our campus and it was, man, it was delightful. Um, it was a group of young people who, um, I don't know, I, I connected with them. I felt that they connected with me and what we're doing. And um, I thought, OK, we're on to something here. So. We are thrilled to have that relationship with Bruce Randolph School. They're a great partner. and I would love for them to be on our campus one day. So too. that would be my goal. Um, a very important question, is Chili Fest happening? Is the Pueblo Chili Fest happening it's this year? It's coming up. And you were, you were a part of that, I think it was two years ago. Yes, that is such year. a great event. I encourage folks to head down there yeah, for that. Yeah, the, 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 the Chili and Frijoli Festival is, um, it's really kind of the premier event in Pueblo. It brings people from across the, the globe and uh, it's all about the chili, and it should be. Yeah, that's a wonderful <laughs> event, and it really showcases this regional specialty. That's it does that the whole incredible. town smells beautiful. It's it's the, the the roasting of the chilies. And when I first arrived, there was a lot of hype around the pueblo chili, and I was always thinking, okay, let me let me try it. And is it worth the hype? coming from Texas, especially? I, right? I yeah. was coming from Texas, but I. Um, it's hands down. It's, it's the legit, it's legit. It's got a unique flavor, taste, culture, and history. And the pride of the people who produce these makes you love them more. So it's chilies to Pueblo. It's a cultural thing and it's very important to us. All right. Well, uh, President Mote, we are about out of time. I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, where can people find you and the university on social media if they want to learn more? I'm on Twitter at Timothy P. Mote, and I'm on LinkedIn. Right. But the university has um, all, all social media. All the channels. CSU okay. Pueblo, one word. Okay. We will also link to, um, to you and to the university in the show notes as okay. well. So um, for my last question, this is a spur of the moment question. So... You don't know what's coming at you Got here. It. Shoot. Um, so if I could give you a free plane ticket anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? Yeah, I'd go to Paris, France. He answered that question so quickly. <laughs> yeah. It's like you knew it was coming. I promise he didn't. So I'm, say I'm, more about that. Why Paris? I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, my family is a French heritage. I'm a Francophile. Um, I'm fascinated with the country, the people, the culture. It's where I like to spend my time. So if you were to give me a ticket, I'd go in a heartbeat. Okay. Is that coming? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I wish that I had one in, in each under, hand, one it, for one for you and one for me. We is it under somewhere. my seat? It's like not, it's Oprah not show. Oprah. I'm okay. so sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thanks again for your time. And uh, we hope that you will all join us again on the next Spur of the Moment podcast. The Spur of the Moment podcast is produced by Peach Islander Productions, and our theme music is by Ketza. Please visit the show notes for links mentioned during today's episode. We hope you'll join us in two weeks for the next Spur of the Moment episode. Until then, be well.